Hey, welcome back, Rise Up Nation. We're here for another episode of Rise Up in Real Estate. We're smack in the middle of season four, where in this season, you guys know already, we're just interviewing practitioners. We're sitting down with some of who I think are the best of the best in this business, full-time, hardworking real estate professionals in this market where we are in coastal South Carolina, and just asking them a few questions, getting to know them a little bit. And I'm hoping in the next 30 minutes, you can gain some insight on how to do business better with my friend, the man, the myth, the pocket square legend, Mike Fiebernitz. Mike, thank you so much for taking 30 minutes to be on the show today. I appreciate you very much. Absolutely. Hey, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, you know, give you 30 minutes of whatever I can pull out of my brain and, you know, give to your audience. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. The good thing about like we at our brokerage at our company, we only hire people that are interested in collaboration. So for me to ask Mike to be on the show, he's like, yeah, whatever, do whatever, however I can help. If you think you can get something out of this head that makes sense to someone, but I would be remiss. Here we are in January of 2024 it's actually the, what is it, the 16th, of, 16th day of January. We're smack in the middle of NFL playoffs, and we just came off of a team winning the national championship in college football. This boy right here I've got on the call is a Michigan man. Mike, tell me a little bit about how proud you are to be for to be a Michigan guy right now. Oh, my gosh. So I grew up in Flint, Michigan, and just – Watching Saturday football games with my dad, watching Michigan, you know, Big Ten football, ground and pound, um, you know, it growing up with that type of success, Bo Schembechler, Lloyd Carr, Charles Woodson, I mean, all these players and, you know, just having to go through the last like 12 years up until COVID was just so rough. And even the COVID year was rough. And then to finally, uh, three years in a row, we beat Ohio State, three years in a row, Big Ten champions, three years in a row, college football playoff. And then finally this year, we ran the college football playoff and we won the national championship. I mean, it, it's just, it's a long time coming and it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where when it happens, it's, it's like once in a lifetime possibility, but uh, you know, to return to the top of uh, college football uh, is, is fantastic. I mean, it's, it's unreal. Yeah. What you don't, what you guys don't know about Mike. And I do know this about Mike and I know Mike a little bit. This is an athlete. Like he was a serious big time football and baseball player. Um, I've got so many stories I can tell about Mike, which is funny. I mean, I don't even do that in this show, but like, I just know how much he loves sports and for him to be in his element, like my, my really seriously, the highlight, one of the highlights of my entire 2023, and I'm a big college football fan, also basketball. I'm, I'm just a sports nut was that was when you sent me that video message of you standing on the field when you guys beat Ohio State this year, it it literally gave me goosebumps. I'm like, my wife and I were sitting there, we're like, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. It was crazy. Was that a pretty special moment for you? It it, it was. <laughs> and it was, so here's, you know, just a, you know, kind of put the cherry on the top to this story. It's been a dream of mine to go to a Michigan Ohio State football game. And, um, you know, the tickets are not cheap. It's the biggest rivalry in, in all of price sports, um, at least top five, probably top three easy, but it it's, if not, it's, it's probably top rivalry. So I decided this was probably going to be the year that I need to go because I had a feeling Harbaugh was going to leave. So, you know what, let's, let's go. Um, and when, when I went a couple of things I wanted to do, when I got to the stadium at tailgate, the first one was back in 2012 was the last time I went to a Michigan game. We played low brother, Michigan state. And my cousin showed me the tailgate on the golf course. Now I had no idea what he was talking about, but we walked across the street from our tailgate to the, uh, to the Ann Arbor country club golf course. And there are cars tailgating all up and down the fairways. And I nice. couldn't believe it. So this year, I was just like, I want to tailgate 
um, on the golf course. But I, I, you know, I'll just find someone. But I was lucky enough to where my uncle's brother-in-law, uh, his wife actually, his his wife's parents actually tailgated for thirty years on the golf course. So here I am, like on the golf course, tailgating. Boom. All right, number one. Check number number check two. Okay, I just I I learned that there's no bad seats at the big house at all. Um, just because you're so on top of the field and it just it goes up, but it's so large, there's no bad seat. But I wanted to be Michigan side and as close to the 50 yard line as possible. So I did that. I got 40 yard lines and it was just me. And so I got to the, uh, to my seats and the thing I told every, everyone at tailgate was we're going to win today and we're going to win in the final seconds by six points and I'm rushing the field. Now, everyone's kind of looking at me because they're a little worried about, you know, Ohio State being really good this year. They got Marvin Harrison Jr., stuff like that. And I said, I'm rushing the field. We're going to win. Guys, we're going to win. So so this is, this is crazy that history repeated itself. The last game I went to was 2012 against Little Brother, Michigan State, our second biggest rivalry. And at that game, uh, me and my cousin were up in the corner of the end zone and we took a picture. I still have that picture to this day, but right next to me is a Michigan state fan. Okay. We won with eight seconds to go. We kicked the field goal one with eight seconds to go. Me and my cousin rushed the field. I got pictures with a bunch of like medical students. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I get to my seat. And all, you know, my, my wife knew I was already doing this, but I started high-fiving everyone. And I'm like, I'm from Myrtle beach. I'm here. This is my dream. And there, and then all of a sudden the guy behind me, um, said, so next you are Ohio state fans. Now they weren't at their seats, but I thought he was joking. I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, they went to go get some food, but there's Ohio state fans right next to you. And I thought my first thought was <laughs> one, we are in like the alumni section where <laughs> people graduated like 40, 50 years ago and have been season ticket holders for 40, 50 years. I'm like, who in their right mind would buy tickets in this section? But I, I didn't believe them. But when they walked past, they walked right in front of me. And I just went, oh my gosh, we are going to win this game in the final seconds by six points and I'm rushing the field. So, so the entire time I'm telling everyone, and I remember the, the, the family in front of me, uh, the husband and the wife actually graduated from Michigan like 30, 40 years ago. And <laughs> the husband in front of me is going, He's looking back going, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, I'm going to rush the field with Mike. And the wife's like, no, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. So <laughs> so I'm gathering people to rush the field. And it's not, it's not even like the first, second quarter, okay? So the second goal I wanted to do is I wanted to – one of the things at the big house at a Michigan game is they put on Mr. Brightside – and the entire stadium sings Mr. Brightside, the entire song, word for word, full song. <laughs> and I'm like, I want to sing this song. So when it came on in the third quarter, I'm belting out Mr. Brightside the entire time. I'm like, <laughs> Jack. So then, um, so then we're getting to the, uh, to the fourth quarter and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's coming down to the last drive, 25 seconds to go quarterback for Ohio state throws a interception and we seal the game and we win by five. And I looked at everyone. I'm like, 
if you're coming, let's go. And I just ran down there and I just started making my way through the crowd to the, uh, to the uh, wall. And then once it hit zero, I went to jump over my mindset. I was still 24 years old, <laughs> but my body was just like, no, nah, man, you're, you're in your forties. This ain't happening. And I kind of did this like roll over and I'm like, kind of like having trouble. And I had this like young kid help me down. Um, <laughs> which when in 2012, I, in 2012, I actually, uh, when I jumped the wall, I had a huge like drink that spilt all over me and just, you know, I just kept on going. And now, uh, you know, 11 years later, I was just uh, like rolling over the wall because my knees were bad and I was just like, <laughs> this ain't working. But I, I knew I was just like, turn on your camera because I, I don't know when the next time this is going to happen. And I, ju I just started running and screaming and it just, I hit a wall of kids like maybe 10 yards after like I got down and it for a good 20, 30 minutes, we, it, we were just sandwiched. Uh, and it, it was just amazing. Just yeah, that's to do that. That's incredible. I'm, I'm proud. What leads to, to that? I mean, it, what, this is part of what we focus on is your life is critically important. I mean, it's what we're here for, right? To live those moments um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, gosh, there's so many things I could ask you, but let's talk a little bit about real estate. Uh, you and I, we talk about everything else all the time. <laughs> let's give real estate five minutes. Um, you've been pretty successful as an individual agent. Now you're leading a team. Uh, I know you and Joey are having a lot of success last year and going into this year. I know Joey totally enjoys what he's doing there with you, but talk a little bit about your real estate journey, Mike. What, where, where are you now in your journey? When did you get your license? Try to relate to the audience a little bit about your story. So when, uh, so a little backstory on me, um, I graduated college with a computer degree and I graduated in 2003, which that's like the dot-com era. And, yeah. you know, coming out of college at, at that point, I was competing against like computer engineers from MIT, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I went to a teacher school at Appalachian State and, you know, I was just getting looked over. So, um, you know, there's no jobs and, uh, you know, on the table for me in the computer field, but I waited tables here every summer at TGI Fridays, which you know, they offered me a management position. I thought, well, all right, management position, salary, benefits, I'll take it until I can find a computer job. Well, that was not what I expected. And I only lasted about 10 months because uh, I bought a business off my uncle down here in Myrtle Beach in 2004, which that's how I got to, you know, Myrtle Beach. Okay. Um, after about seven or eight years, I realized that, the the business I was in was not sustainable. Um, you know, it was fun to have in my 20s. Uh, but then around like when I started turning 30 years old, I started realizing I, I need to find something else, which I had a friend that owned a independent real estate company that came to me and said, you would be great in this. You'd be awesome. You need to do this. And uh, I think after about six to 12 months, I finally said, all right, let's talk. Um, because you know, I not I can't find anything else in this town. So um, so I sat down and I got licensed in 2011. And you know, I just I just dove in head first. And you know, being an athlete is what really helped me because I had coaches everywhere, you know, in sports. So um I just whatever I was told, I just did it. And you know, I lasted there at the independent company about three and a half years just because of the fact that um, it it ran its course. Um, you know, it's it's a good company if you're like a brand new agent. But after after you start closing about 15, 20 deals, it, it's, you know, no one lasts in this company. 
Um, so then I went to Century 21 because, you know, there's that brand out there. But I didn't really, and I this is my mistake, I didn't, I didn't research other companies. I just saw that they were like the number one company. So I was just like, that's where I want to go because I want to be number one. And, you know, that's the competitiveness in me. And I went there. Um, you know, it, the experience wasn't all that great for me, but I was there for about four years. And finally, I almost actually I almost left real estate at that point. And I was about to jump back into computers or else considering it just because of the fact that, uh, yeah, I just thought, you know, this is real estate. This is, this is not for me, but, uh, then I sat down with you and, um, you know, everything you said, it just, it clicked. It's exactly like how I am. And, um, I said, okay, all right. I, I, I think this might be the company. Uh, but then I, I have to tell this story, Ted, that uh, I had to interview with Remax Southern Shores three times, <laughs> which I had like, I had no idea what was going on. So I interviewed with you, Tad, and then you said, all right, well, let's do this. Let's, uh, let's have you sit down with me and Rennie, the broker. I said, okay. And then after that, I was like, all right. Still, I have to sit down with more people, and I had to come back for a third interview. But you know, after you know, after you know, getting in here, uh, you know, and talking to Mandy, you and Rennie, you know, my my past is what was the hesitation. I get that, and you know, you you just don't realize you're in the wrong place until you get out of there and you get into the right place. Yeah, and yeah. once I got to Remax, it just, uh, it, it, it's exactly how I want to run my business. And that's what has basically created the opportunity for me to build my business and for my business to basically flourish and, uh, yeah. you know, scale. So, yeah. So, so, um, a little bit of backstory. I appreciate you saying that. We do have a culture that we try to protect, although we don't ask everybody to take three interviews. There, had, you just came along after we had been burned. You were the recipient of us being burned by someone from a similar environment, and we were just yeah. being super careful. And and actually, frankly, the first time I met you, it just seemed too good to be true. Like we clicked just like that, and I was yeah. like, I don't know, um, but we are the winners that we got yet. I'm glad for that. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate you being patient because a lot of people probably would have said middle finger, I'm down the road, you know? <laughs> uh, but anyway, you said something interesting to me while you were just talking, which I think is, uh, I think our listeners need to attach to. You grew up an athlete. I mean, you're an athlete now. You're And your wife played college volleyball, right? Did she play at yeah. uh, Texas UT? Yep. <clears throat> um, oh, yeah. And by, I saw them, play, I actually watched them on TV this last, they were in the final four or something. And I oh, was yeah. like, I know a little bit about this because I, I can relate to Mike yeah. and Tammy. Shout out to Tammy for being tall and athletic. Yep. But it, that led you to being very, very, and you still are, very coachable, teachable, right? Absolutely. Oh, you, 100%. Didn't you learn this a lot? Isn't there a real special connection with you and your dad? Don't you tell me a little bit about what your dad has meant to you? Tell me a little bit about that. So growing up, my, I, growing up, my dad, I, I believe, missed his calling in coaching and phenomenal coach. Um, and he, he took it on to coach me, uh, in baseball since I was a little kid, because, you know, my dad was knocking on the doors of, uh, possibly being drafted, uh, by the Cincinnati Reds. And, um, when he, when he had me, he told me that he had a goal to basically, you know, teach me, coach me, uh, so that way I can get to the major league level. So the amount of coaching that he did was it, it was, it, it was just minor, it was minor, uh, coaching tips that he did, um, to improve me. 
just uh, just a millimeter of improvement because right. and that's all it took. But, you know, he just continuously coached me and coached me. And I just learned that, you know, just listen to the coaching and then, you know, and then you'll, you'll, you know, you'll, you know, do great in whatever you do. Um, and then, of course, when I go off to college, I play college football I had on the offensive side, I think I had like eight coaches. I mean, I had quarterbacks coach, running backs coach, tight ends coach. I mean, there's a coach for every single position. You got an offensive coordinator. You had the head coach. I mean, you had coaches like every which way that was just nonstop coaching you. And, you know, that's important just because of the fact that you're a team of people that are, you know, under and working under a common goal. So you have to listen to all of these coaches because if, if not, then you're just, you know, you're just doing something for yourself. And, uh, you know, my dad was always the one that would call up and I would always call him for the voice of reason. And right. because, you know, when he coached you from a kid to, uh, uh, to a teenager and, uh, through high school and, um, you know, when he's coaching you like every single day on every little aspect of baseball and football, it's just, it's easy to, it's easy to just be coachable and to be able to learn and, you know, adapt to anything you do. And yeah. that's why athletes, you know, strive, uh, thrive in, um, you know, anything they do after sports is because of that. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit. I want to ask you this in real estate, because you how, you've been in real estate for you said 2011. You got licensed. Is that what you said? Yeah. So you've been in it about 12 years, 13 years. What has worked for you? Like if you could narrow it down to one little bit of advice or success uh, connection that you have, what's the what's the number one thing that you would say? I mean, coachable might be it, like your ability to take coaching and turn it into positive. But Tell me something else that's really worked for you that might help our listeners. Uh, so, so definitely something that's worked for me is one thing is if I can't change it, don't worry about it. You know, it, it's, it's one of those things that look, it, it, if it can't be changed, then why fret? Why worry? There's no point. Um, you know, it's just a waste of, uh, your mental, you know, mentalness or, you know, it's just a, it's just a waste and a, a drain on you. Okay. Um, so that's helped me out. Um, that's like a good, per, that's a, you're, you're saying perspective is basically what you're saying. Like, yeah. And in your business, like you work primarily with sellers, is that correct now in your business? Yeah. So there's a lot of circumstances during a transaction. Gosh, yeah. could, a, could, could an agent learn something from that? Like, you do all you can to fix whatever you can fix, but at some point you realize, Hey, this is a hurdle. We're not going to get over. Let's just don't fret over it. Let's yeah, just, move, it's, just move on. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of agents tend to stress over, you know, things that are, you know, you can't change it. And um, so that's, that's one thing I learned and to be able to have patience and uh, you know, not, not worry about anything that changed. What's also worked is, just go after it. take a chance um you know my dad taught me he's just like look you're it's it's not like everything is hinging on this one thing you're trying to accomplish you know like for instance business you know if you're scared and you don't try and go get the business then you know, you're, you're just going to be scared and you're not going to get the business on the next one. And he said, every day, real estate is happening. Every day, buyers are buying. Every day, sellers are selling. Why not you be that agent that helps them? And he, he, he was perfect on this because when I was talking to him, I was having problems. He, um, he brought up when he was a stockbroker, um, at um oh i forgot merrill lynch in the 80s and he said it's the exact same thing you know that's all it is you're 
you're one, you're selling yourself to these people. And two, it's all about the numbers, you know, so stop, you know, stop worrying about this one thing and just look at, just look at what you have to do in a year's time and then back it all the way down to just the inches. And then that's when he brought up all the coaching uh, they done as a, as a kid. He, you know, when I was a kid, he just said, look, it's, it's, this is a game of inches. Stop trying to accomplish what you want to accomplish in a year, in a day or in a month, you know? So he said, figure out what you have to do every single day and the law of averages will take care of everything else. And he said it, every single day, there's probably thousands of properties being sold. Um, so why not you? Why not you be that agent? And then my perspective on the uh, on my business basically changed because then I started going, okay, let's just look at how many contacts I have to make a day. And, you know, I basically started with my goal, worked all the way backwards, how many appointments I have to do. And then I'm very structured in my business to where, uh, and I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm very math forward. Like I'm all about numbers. I'm very analytical. And I just backed it all the way down. And since I realized every day, all I got to do is come in here and make this many contacts or have this many conversations every single day, I will do this business to obtain this income. Mm -hmm. And it's worked every single year since my dad told me that, which he told me in 2019, because um, when I made the switch to Remax, that is when like I was trying to figure everything out. Um, you know, I was basically on my own. I had to make the decisions. And when I called my dad, he told me that. He said, this yeah, is easy. Yeah. This is easy. I, I thought this was something serious. He said, <laughs> it's, he said, Mike, you're, you're fretting about nothing. He said, yeah. there's more than enough business out there. Figure out how many people you have to talk to every day and focus on that. And then when the opportunity comes, you jump on it. Yeah. But if it's a no, Roll don't on. waste your time on trying to convince them to be a yes. Yeah. Just say, yeah. Thank you. I'm one step closer to my yes. Yeah. And I was just like, that is insane. And so I just do that and I just every single year. And, uh, you know, what's crazy is I think two years ago, um, I think I was around September, October, and I had, I, I keep track of my, uh, appointments and, uh, my contracts I get and my closings and, I, I knew at the start of the year what my uh, percentages were for each of those. So I looked to where I was at September and they were off by like 0.6%. That's how close they were. Yeah. And yeah. I'm just like, it, it works. Yeah. So, that's crazy. That's uh, there's so many things that are true about that. Like that's the compound effect. It's the, it's the same as you're, you're dealing with what we call leading indicators, not lagging indicators. You're doing the things that you can control and it's interesting that you don't worry about the results of it while it's happening. You, the results just happen. Like the no's lead you to yeses, yeah. but it's it that right now there's a lot of coaching changes going on. And I heard one of the guys say today, something similar to this, and man, you're so fortunate to have been in a coaching environment growing up with your, you're so lucky to have your dad. I know you know that, but they said these guys, these teams are not looking at these coaches and saying, Hey, what can that coach do for me next year? They're saying, what, what will we be like in three years or five years if we hire that person? And that's exactly what you're saying. Like, do the things along the way. You don't become mm -hmm. a – you play college football. You don't become yeah. a college – Division One college football player. And, I, by the way, that highlight of you jumping on the pile is still one of my favorites. <laughs> I'm going to try to find that link and put it in the show notes. But uh, were you number 87? 89? Uh, 83. 83. I knew it was a, something. Um, but you – you know, those moments that you have, like you're, you're building for, you're building for the future. You're doing right. daily, daily activities. And if you don't let your emotions get caught up in it then you stay focused on the task, like you don't become a college football player overnight. Mm -hmm. You yeah. don't just graduate from high school and walk in the gym and say, Hey, Mr. Trainer, make me a college tight end. I would like to go play at Appalachian state. Yeah. 
things that you did when you were seven years old led to that. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? And your 100%. dad, your dad, and did I hear you right? You kind of inferred that your dad kind of put his career on the back burner to help you develop. Was that what I just heard you say? Kind of like, his yeah, going, basically going to the, the Reds possibly. And he said, you know what? I'm gonna stick with my son. Yeah. He, uh, yeah, he, he was being looked at by the Reds and, um, you know, I think I was just born, but he, that's uh, awesome. He didn't put his career on hold. What, what happened was, uh, back then, you know, they didn't have their internet cell phones or anything like that. Uh, but he was told that he was going to be drafted, uh, the second catcher to be drafted and they're going to draft his high school catcher. And he never got the phone call, like the phone never rang. And then finally, after I think a day or two later, he found out that one of the high school catchers that was supposed to go to another team dropped and the Reds picked up them and another, uh, another catcher. So. Gotcha. But, gotcha. Game of inches, man. Game of inches. It, that's all it is. So you're a, and we haven't even talked about this. It's interesting that we've talked about your real estate. You, Mike is a consummate dialer. Like if you are wondering what oh, kind of yeah. business he has, he's in right now. He's got, you see him. If you're looking on YouTube, he's got his headset on. He's ready to roll pocket square oh. on ready to go. But you're, you're, that's your business, right? You just, you're going to outdo the phones. That's what you do. That's it. I just, uh, you know, I just pick up the phones and I just call like, yeah, I call anyone and uh, you know, that's, that's where the business is at. And my dad taught me this. He said, look, if you, if, if you don't pick up the phone, the phone's not going to ring for you. You know, yeah. you yeah. got to go get the business. The business is not going to come to you. Uh, yeah. you have to create the business. So, that's cool. so I just turned around and I just started picking up the phone and, um, you know, I've, uh, massaged and molded my scripts based on, you know, what worked for me, what was, you know, what fit my personality. And, um, you know, I just, I kept on getting better and better on the phones. And, you know, so I just, I call expireds. I call uh, what's called just sold. Basically, if I sell a property, I'll turn around and call the entire neighborhood, just let them know and see if, you know, they're selling. I'll call just listed. Um, you know, that's, that that's an easy conversation because you uh you you kind of break down the seller's wall pretty quickly with that yeah and um and then i just i just call my past clients and those are like the four uh those are the four parts of my business that i call and i don't really need to call anything else yeah and you've been doing it for a while you're consistent at it your name people probably know your name in neighborhoods now because you've done it for so long that's pretty cool and and by the way you can do you just need to pick something and yeah. do it like like I, I think of nick pelosi and doing video and doing it very well like very well and tj o'brien doing client parties and doing them very well and you doing mm -hmm. phone call and you just got to pick something to stay consistent with it i mean go back to being an athlete it's the same thing I wanted to, you, before we wrap up here, I can't believe how fast time goes. We talked about, I want to talk about Michigan again, but we won't. Uh, tell me if you could give some advice out there, like save us some trouble, Mike. Like tell us if if you're, don't do this. If there's anything, do not go here. I did, tried it, it didn't work. Or if you have this characteristic, you might as well hang it up. What doesn't work? Um... What doesn't work is what doesn't work is sitting around and hoping it just well hold on probably what doesn't work is just not doing anything at all right right do okay. something right yeah. if you fail it's not the end of the world just learn from you know the mistake or the failure and just get better yeah uh look at every failure as if it's a learning experience yeah but don't sit around and wait for someone else to do the business for you um go out and just try it i mean worst thing can happen is it doesn't work <laughs> at least you know okay that didn't work 
Um, maybe I should do it a different way or maybe I should just cut it out, but just do something, try something. Uh, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world. Um, you're not a failure because it doesn't work, but just, you know, you're worse off if you just don't do anything at all. It's so funny when I, when I asked you that question, I didn't know that I would stump you with a question, but you don't know, you don't even, it's almost like you don't even think that way. Uh, uh-uh. I don't. Like you, it was like the answer was everything works, dude. Just go do it. Just do something. That's what that was kind of it what is. your face told me when I asked that question. Yeah, so that's good. I was just like, um, I mean, it it's this business is is it's all in the mindset. Right. I mean, right. that's all it is. And uh, there's so much business out there that you know, it's don't get hung up on, you know, just the failure. Um right. Right. You know, it's and then that's why it's so hard for me to answer that question is because I I don't look at it as a failure. I'm not going to do it. I look at it as uh, that's just, it's not the right way. Um, right. Right. You know. Right. I love that. Do you have a book that you love, Mike, something that you've read that makes a di- difference for you or like I'm not a huge reader, but is there something that. So you know, I don't have. Uh, a book that I would probably say you need to go out and get, but I will make a couple recommendations that have been great books for me. Okay. Um, number one, I would say uh, the Lombardi rules. Okay. That's about Vince Lombardi. Love it. A um, couple more, the go giver. Love it. Go givers sell more. Okay. Um, That's perfect. Yeah. And I would probably say uh, this is a Remax plug for Jordan, but the Agent's Edge, that was a fantastic book uh, by yeah. George Cohen, which we all know. Um, you know, Rejection Proof. Good one. I love that one. The richest man in Babylon. You know, so I mean, only, it, other other than uh, other than calling you read, it sounds like. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. That's great. Um, well, I mean, you've you've shared so many good nuggets. I've what I've learned is that you are so connected to that coaching mindset that you just you're gonna win, no matter what. Like you're gonna you're gonna do what it takes. You're not going to stress about the things you can't change. Um, what if somebody out there wanted to reach out to you? Like, where's the easiest place to find Mike? What is something you said today really resonated? And they said, I'd love to take that guy to coffee when he's not phone calling. Um, um, how, can they find, how can they find you easiest, Mike? Yeah, they can, uh, they can just call or text me. Okay. Um, or they can email me. All right, cool. You know, it's whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. Spell your last name so we don't so that my listeners don't mess it up. This is Mike <laughs> Mike Fiebernitz. Spell it for me. Yes. Uh F I E B E R N I T Z. Awesome. It's a very good Irish name. I'm just kidding. What uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh no, not Irish. Uh so- Listen, um, man, I'm, I'm so happy to have had you for 30 minutes to chat. I mean, I, you guys out there listening to this, take a minute to uh, find him on social media or in his email or whatever, message him, get together with him. He's just a good person, uh, great uh, asset to our company and just to us in general. I mean, I don't know if uh, my son played basketball at a pretty high level in high school and then COVID didn't allow him to play in college or he just did, he decided not to. But the coaches used to call him the glue guy. Yeah. Like when he when he was on the court, he just galvanized the team. Like he wasn't the best. He didn't score the most all the time, but he was just, he just brought people together. And I believe that about you. I think I, if I had to say that about our company, we've got a couple of you that are like that, but you definitely um, have brought a lot to us. I'm glad we interviewed you for three times and you tolerated it. <laughs> and you yeah. Still came. And you still so the, more. <laughs> yeah. So the uh real quick to to kind of piggyback off that on uh 
you know, being the glue and galvanizing. Um, that came from Bo Schembechler. And growing up as Bo Schembechler, it was all about the team. And there's the the team speech, and you can easily find it on YouTube, but it's Bo Schembechler talking to the Michigan football team, and he's talking about, you know, all these teams can get all these great quarterbacks, great running backs, great cornerbacks, but they don't have the team. And that is – that is why I, I I have been so successful here in Remax is because this is a team atmosphere. And, um, you know, I have grown up my entire life on a team. And, you know, you're in real estate, it is individual. But um, I mean, anything, you know, anyone out there that is running a team or, you know, run in a real estate company to where, you know, you need to recruit, look into Bo Schembechler and how he built these players, not as individuals, but as the team, because it's all about the team, the team, the team. See, I'm already getting chills. I'm yeah, getting chills I'm gonna, talking about I'll, it. I'll, I'll find that link uh, in you on YouTube. I've seen that before and I'll put it in the show notes. So when people listen to the show, yep. they'll, they'll be able to click on it. Um, Cause that is, uh, that's quite a standard. I bet he was probably the guy that took everybody's name off their Jersey. Like probably. Was, they never had names on their Jersey back then. They were just yeah. like, I don't know. He's number 12. He's going to do his part. Number yep. 12 is going to do his part. Oh but, yeah. Uh, you, you've been a great uh, interview, Mike. I appreciate you sharing so much about what coaching means to you. And, and I, I just wish you and Tammy and, uh, you guys and Joey, just a lot of success and all blessings for 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time, buddy. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Well, Hey, that's a wrap folks. Thank you so much for listening to rise up in real estate. If you'd like hanging out with us today, please find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at rise up in real estate. Also follow us right now on your favorite podcast host to hear more episodes. We really appreciate you spending some of your time with us. And until next time, let's do each other a favor and all help each other rise up. Rise up.